Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit WPSU.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at WPSU.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling Indian in the room issues. Was you don't ever say to her that I'm one of the shower points. She's qualified for services. We left. We're trying to take back over. We're doing in autism. Jake Corman is serving his fourth consecutive term in the Pennsylvania State Senate. He represents the 34th Senatorial District, which includes all of Juniata, Perry, and portions of Center, Mifflin, and Union Counties. State Senator Corman is currently the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee and also serves as a member of the Banking and Insurance, Education, Rules and Executive Nominations, and State Government Committees. From Marcellus Shale to redistricting to school vouchers, we'll talk with him about his legislative priorities for 2012, as well as his thoughts on the Republican primary. Here's our conversation with Pennsylvania State Senator Jake Corman. Jake Corman, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Great to be here. As uh, chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, you are uh, the most powerful Senate Republican <laughs> in Pennsylvania. And I just have to say, you've come a long way since our days uh, uh, in radio sales at WMAJ. Well, we don't want to talk about how many years that's been, <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know that the most powerful is accurate. I like to say I got to be appropriations chairman right when the Commonwealth went broke. Uh, <laughs> so I haven't had uh, this wheeling, dealing of power of money to, to spend. Uh, we've been spending all our time trying to figure out how the state can spend less in the last three years. So uh, I, I appreciate uh, the thought, but I'm not sure it's quite accurate. Um, and how, how difficult was it for you uh, to come up with the state's $27 billion budget? Well, I mean, it was hard because when the, the first year I, I became chairman is right in 2008, 2009, when the economy started really uh, to falter. And uh, state government is funded through consumption taxes, uh, income taxes, sales tax. Uh, that's about 75 percent of the amount of taxes, the revenue that we get at the state. And so when the economy drops, as it did dramatically, uh, our revenues dropped dramatically, about $3 billion. Uh, so, you know, initially we used uh, stimulus dollars from Washington, D.C. To, to sort of offset our loss. Uh, but, you know, anytime you borrow money to pay operating costs, eventually, as was essentially what we did, eventually that day of reckoning comes. And, and that came this year. And it was difficult. I mean, you, you, a lot of programs in the past that people have supported for whatever reason, uh, we couldn't afford to do anymore. Uh, we had to do what every private business, private home uh, families were doing, uh, which was figure out how to do with less. And uh, that was not necessarily easy because most people come to the Capitol for you to spend more money, not to spend less money. And so I, um, you know, had to tell a lot of people no because we just didn't have the resources. So, but we got through it. One of the difficult things you had to uh, work through was uh, state funding for higher education. Sure. Of course, Penn State mm -hmm. was uh, was uh, affected 52.4 percent cut is what uh, Governor Corbett was looking for. Right. That ultimately is not what what happened. But how difficult were those negotiations, especially considering that Penn State uh, receives less in state appropriations than any other university in the Big Ten. Yeah. Well, it, you know, for whatever reason, uh, higher education has not received the priority at state government that I think it deserves, and, and some others do as well. Uh, it's always the last to get money when times are doing or times are good, and, and so it's the first to get cut uh, when things aren't going so well as they have been recently. And, and I think a lot of that, you know, if you look at Penn State, um, you know, when when you're trying to dole out a, a finite amount of state resources. Uh, you usually go to try to go to the places in the most need. Well, Penn State's a lot of things. It doesn't necessarily look needy. Uh, but that's the wrong way to look at it. See, I always review, look at state government's investment in higher education, particularly Penn State and Pitt and as Temple as, as well, is they provide in-state tuition. The private schools don't provide in-state tuition. Those schools, along with the state system, do. And what our money does to state taxpayers that we invest in those schools is it buys down tuition for Pennsylvania students. Uh, I, I believe Penn State... And this is rough. You know, they probably have about a twenty-seven thousand per year tuition for out-of-state students, and about twenty-six something, twenty-six right? something, and, and fourteen for in-state. Yeah, so that's a twelve thousand-dollar benefit those students are getting because of the money the Commonwealth uh, invests. So I always look at it as not 
the university is getting this money. It's the students uh, that are benefiting uh, from this money. And so uh, I've always been a, a strong component because I think higher education uh, is, is so very important. Uh, when you and I met, I didn't have a college degree uh, at that point in time. And quite frankly, my ceiling was, was somewhat capped to where I could go in my life. And then as an adult, I decided to go back and got a degree. And since then, my ceiling, what I wanted to do in my life has risen. And I just think it's so important to either have a skill, a trade, or or some sort of uh, education background for you to succeed in, in, in this economy today. And so, uh, therefore, I've always been a big proponent of it. You recently, I don't know if it was last year, uh, you went on a fact-fighting mission to all of the state, yeah. uh, state institutions of higher learning. Mm -hmm. What did you learn by, by going to see these places uh, in person? Well, I thought it was important because when the governor proposed a 50 some percent uh, cut last year, and it was mostly driven by math. I mean, the economics and the budget was such a problem. I don't know that he was necessarily wanting to cut higher ed. It's just that the budget uh, uh, facts demanded that he put some sort of big cut somewhere to find savings. And so I thought it was important for us to go out on these campuses, not just to bring them to Harrisburg, and we'll find out what these schools do. Uh, what do these schools do with the money that we give them from the state, and and how does the Pennsylvania benefit? Uh, you know, so so, it's, so maybe so we could learn more about uh, the importance of, of these higher education schools. And what I found is uh, what they provide is access, and you know they're providing opportunities. Uh, for, for people who don't have the money to go to a private university to still get a quality education. You mentioned just a moment ago that you didn't have your college degree when we met in, yeah. in, in radio sales 25 yeah. years ago. Now you weren't um, supposed to say the years. Well, well, okay, well, Sorry. <laughs> but you had an associate degree at that yeah. point, and, I, and I've always been curious. Actually, I didn't. Um, I got that later, too. Oh, okay. All yeah. right, so you got your, your uh, bachelor's yeah. in communications yeah. um, uh, from Penn State. Yep, it was journalism, yep. Um, but I've always been curious, because you're now 13 years at your job in mm -hmm. the state Senate. Mm -hmm. Your father had that position for 21 years. Yeah. Did you grow up kind of thinking, someday I'm going to follow in my father's footsteps? Never. Uh, it was never something I wanted to do. Uh, I was in a journalism background because I loved uh, sports. I wanted to be in sports broadcasting. I actually did that. Uh, in Williamsport for a few years, and that was the career I wanted to, you know, I always, you know, first I wanted to be an athlete. Of course, I, I peaked at 10 about how good of an athlete I was going to be, so that, that quickly went to the wayside, and then I, you know, loved sports and loved covering sports, and so I, I got into journalism and got my degree and did some sports broadcasting and decided that uh, uh, that wasn't going to be a, a, a career for me where I wanted to go, and so that's when I transitioned. I actually, what really got me to interest in politics is when uh, a friend of mine, uh, Rick Santorum, won the U.S. Senate race in, in 1994. You were his state director for four years. I, I went to work for him. I, he, he, I'd known him since I was 12. Uh, he was a friend of the family, and so I went to work for him, and that's where I sort of got my bug. Uh, for government service and, and politics. And, and uh, shortly after that, uh, about four years later, I ran for the, the Senate when my father decided to retire. And, and here I've been ever since. But uh, really, you know, I always tell you people, it's sort of normal that you know, you, you, even though your father preaches it all your life, because you, it's your father, you sort of ignore it. Uh, but then when you go to someone else and hear the same thing, but comes from a different source, uh, it, it sort of, you know, the light bulb goes on, so to speak, and so uh, that's where I ended up. I, I want to talk about uh, Rick Santorum in just a moment, yeah. but you certainly knew what the job entailed, because yes. as I said, you, you grew up with this, yes. with your father being the state senator mm -hmm. in, in Belfont. Has the job changed much from what you observed as a child in terms of the demands of the job? Well, I, I think it's a little bit easier now uh, than what it was when my father first started in the 70s because, you know, information transportation arteries are so much better. You know, you don't have to be everywhere all the time that you may have had to before because of communication abilities. Uh, you know, it's just a lot easier to drive to Harrisburg. Uh, I, I come home most nights. My father never came home uh, just because it was a lot more difficult to drive with the, with the there, were, there were a lot of two-lane roads and it wasn't easy to do. Um, for me, it's, you know, it's a pretty easy ride, hour and 40 minutes, and so uh, and it's a comfortable ride. So I, from, just from that perspective, I think it's easier to do. I mean, it's still the same sort of thing. It's a public service. It's, it's getting out and, and, and trying to solve community problems, and, and that's what the job is about. So that... I think it's the same, but as far as demand, you know, I could be working at my son's Lily game, you know, doing an email to mm -hmm. someone because of because of uh, blackberries and, and things of that nature, where my father never could have done that. So, uh, I, so way, from that perspective, I think it's gotten a little bit easier. Although the way Americans look at politicians today, the way they looked mm -hmm. at your father when he was a politician, and the way the public is disgruntled. Mm -hmm. uh, Sixty-four percent of of Americans give Congress, for example, low or extremely yeah. low ratings for uh, ethics and integrity, for example. Well, you know, I think if you go back through 
ever, ever since this country was born, you could see political campaigns and ads and things and, and, and public comments about their, their that have the, always been negative. Yeah, they've always been negative. <laughs> and uh, but but I think it is heightened right now because, quite frankly, and I'll be the first to criticize. I don't think Washington D.C. is doing their job. Uh, you know, I served eight years uh, as a legislator last two as appropriations chairman with Ed Rendell as a governor. Now, Ed Rendell is a Democrat from a big city of Philadelphia. I'm a Republican from, from rural Pennsylvania. But I knew any budget that I passed or any bill that I wanted to get passed, he had to sign. So that means going into it, I had to negotiate with him and compromise with him and, and get things done or, or else you know, we failed our job. I think the first and most important responsibility is to govern, is to do your job. And that means taking less than what you want. That's what you have to do. Uh, in Washington, D.C., nobody governs. Uh, they all sort of go into their positions where they want to be, and no one's willing to compromise. I don't know if that's the 24-hour news networks and, and all that that, that sort of exacerbate that problem, uh, but uh, you have to be willing to compromise. And quite frankly, they're not in Washington, D.C. I think if they had a balanced budget provision as we do, we have to balance the budget by Constitution, we, or we shut down. Uh, if they had that, where they had to balance their budget, they'd make the difficult decisions because they'd have to. Uh, but right now, they just put them off. And so I think that's why people are frustrated at what's going on in Washington. But even at the state level, there a lot of votes are, oh, sure. are, are, are along the party lines. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that always happens. I mean, you're always going to have uh, some of that. Uh, you know, we've, we've had a pretty good uh, relationship. Uh, Vince Hughes is the Democrat chair of Appropriations Committee. Vince is uh, from Philadelphia. Again, I'm from central Pennsylvania, and we're, we're very, very close friends. Uh, I've always told him I would, he'd be the first person I'd trust my children with, more his wife than him, but if I had an <laughs> issue. Uh, so, you know, we, you know, we're not always going to agree, but I always afford him the opportunity to have his say and, 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 to, and to hopefully negotiate something out. And if I can help him, I do. Uh, but you have to govern, and, and that's the important thing. You're always going to have party line votes occasionally. You're always going to have differences, and then obviously, you know, the majority of votes wherever they go uh, will, will will rule the day. But uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot more respect uh, in Harrisburg as far as uh, you know allowing the minority to have you know a, a, a role. Uh, as there is Washington, D.C., where they just all seem to go to their corners. I want to talk about uh, Rick Santorum. You mentioned him yeah. a moment ago, and you were the state director from 1994, I think, to 1998. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you and I think 15 others in the Senate Republican Caucus have have shown your support for yeah. Rick Santorum. He uh, has said that since he announced his bid for uh, for the presidency, that he can't get the national media to pay any attention to sure. him. Um, so... First, I'm wondering, do you continue to support him? Do you yes. think he has a chance? And why Rick Santorum? Well, it was a pretty open field so far. Uh, Rick's the only one from Pennsylvania, uh, someone who I know and, and, and trust. Uh, is like an older brother to me, quite frankly. Uh, that's how far back our families go, as I, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, Iowa will be the, the, the test for Senator Santorum to see how well he does there. You know, no one's voted yet. So, you know, we, we, the, the media and even the, the public, we're, we're so enamored uh, with the horse race and polling and things that you know, no one's voted yet. And we got people who are favorites. We got people who are you know, don't have a chance, and, and not one vote has been cast. Uh, you know, the senator spent a lot of time in Iowa, uh, and uh, he'll have to do well there to uh, to move on. You know, it's sort of like the the Republican nomination is sort of like a Survivor Show. You know, you need to move on, survive, and and and, and stay in the race and, and see how long you can stay. And then the last one uh, ultimately wins. You saw that four years ago with the Democrat field. You know, and. It was Hillary and and and, um, and President Obama, but there was also a lot there, and they were the last two to survive. And so we'll see uh, where that goes, Republican nomination. But I think the senator brings uh, the most experience uh, to the table uh, with his time in U.S. Senate, and uh, so I think he'd be a, a good candidate. And you think he's he's someone who could beat Obama? Uh, you know, every election is about the incumbent. Um, no matter who the Republicans put up, it's going to be about the incumbent because we're going to decide as a as a public whether we want to fire this person, whether it be president, governor, whatever. When you're the incumbent, the first decision the public has to make is, do we want to fire this person? And, you know, so once you made that decision, um, then the, the, the challenger just has to be uh, capable, has to be someone you can be comfortable with. Uh, you know, if the, the challenger can be the greatest person in the world, if you're comfortable with the current office holder being the president, this person's not going to win. The, the president's going to win re-election because that's the first decision we as a public make. And, you know, if President Obama's approval ratings are in the mid-40s to low-40s come Election Day in November next year, he's not going to win uh, unless the Republicans just have a disastrous uh, candidate, which I don't think they will. So uh, whether it be Senator Santorum, whether it be uh, Governor Romney or whoever it may be, 
uh, I think um, the Republican candidate will do well uh, unless there's a dramatic change in the perspective of the performance of the president in the next 11 months. During this latest legislative session, the issues taking center stage in Pennsylvania have been three for the most part. Uh, Marcellus Shale impact mm -hmm. fees, uh, school vouchers, and also privatization of liquor. Yeah. A, a fourth one that has been your priority yeah. has been transportation funding. And if you look at polls and ask Pennsylvanians, uh, transportation funding is way more important to them than whether they can buy bourbon sure. in their grocery store. Sure. Tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing there. Well, um, again, this goes back to governing. Uh, we've had two studies now done by two different governors, uh, a Democrat and a Republican, uh, independent commissions that says we have a transportation problem in Pennsylvania, an infrastructure problem, that the cost of maintaining the system far has outgrown uh, the, our ability to pay for it under the current system. Uh, we have responsibility for roads and bridges in Pennsylvania, not to mention mass transit and some other components. The state legislature and the governor have that responsibility. So if we've identified a problem, to me, there's no excuse not resolving the problem. And we've and ignored it basically since 1997. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's become more of a problem more recently, but 1997 was the last time we did a transportation bill in, in, in Pennsylvania. So, you know, it's, it's, they're not necessarily politically popular things to do, but there's two major benefits. One's a short-term benefit, which puts people to work. About 75% of PennDOT's budget is a pass-through to the private sector. All contracts let out to, to, uh, to the lowest bidder. Uh, and so they're going to be hiring people to do these jobs, which is exactly what we need right now uh, in Pennsylvania is people going back to work. And so, they, so the short-term benefit is, is significant. Uh, and then the long-term benefit is not only are we addressing a problem that we have, uh, but we're, we're creating a better network for, for Pennsylvania to attract businesses to locate here. State College has benefited dramatically over the years with our with our improvements of our uh, you know of our uh, transportation infrastructure. You know, in the old days, uh, you know Bobby Knight when we first joined the Big Ten called it a camping trip, right? right. You can't say that about Pennsylvania. Our, our State College anymore. Our airport's much better. Uh, our roads in the center county are, are, are much much better, and so therefore we're more attractive. You know, I like to say I represent Port Matilda. But nothing comes in here by ship. You know, it's got to come in. Our goods have to come in and out by by truck. And, and so, if we're going to have businesses be successful, which means providing jobs for people, we have to have a transportation system that works. So there's a short-term benefit and a long-term benefit. Now, you take some of those other issues you talked about, which some of them are important, but like the liquor issue. Do I think Pennsylvania should be uh, the, one of the largest wholesalers of alcohol in the world? No. But you know what? You know, the, the number one problem in our country today is jobs and people not having jobs. You know, no one has said, gee, Senator, I'd like to locate a job in Pennsylvania. I'd like to locate a job in your community or start a new business, but I can't because I can't buy a bottle of wine at the local sheet store. No one's ever said that to me. So as important as that issue is, it's not as important as the job issue is uh, in Pennsylvania today. The education as well. Vouchers is important, uh, but it's not, you know, it's not the, it's not going to change the face of education in Pennsylvania one way or another. Uh, I support it and, and I'm happy to support uh, education reform. Uh, but my focus is on jobs and creating jobs, and I think the transportation infrastructure is one way government can 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 get involved uh, and accomplish and two help. things basically. Exactly. And you're talking about a proposal that's 2.5 billion dollars. Where mm -hmm. is that money going to come from? Well, it comes from a variety of sources. One, uh, the, the major source is it, it it relieves the cap on the wholesale. That's on the oil companies that they only pay uh, a tax. Uh, on the first like dollar thirty of a gallon of gasoline, while well, price of gas is a lot higher than that, and, and they're not paying a tax on the rest of that, and that wholesale tax does not translate into a dollar for dollar increase at the pump. Now, am I saying that not, some of that won't get translated to the pump? Sure, it will. Uh, but uh, I think Secretary um, uh, Barry Shook, who was here at State College not too long ago, uh, said that you know, all all the you know there's a few other fees and things of that nature that they're proposing to increase. Um, you know, all that would amount to about $2.50 per person per week uh, as far as increase. And that, I'm not saying that's insignificant, uh, but as he said very clearly, look, you're going to pay it one way or another. Either you're going to pay it through wear and tear on your vehicle because we're not maintaining the roads the way we should, detouring as we've already shut down over 100 bridges in Pennsylvania. And we have uh, more bridges than anyone in the country. Right. They're deficient uh, as well. And so you're, every detour is about a 15 to 20 mile detour. Well, what's that cost in a gallon of gasoline? We're not dealing with, um, with um, 
congestion problems, and that means sitting in your car longer uh, because because that's wasting gallons of gasoline. So you're going to pay it. Now, you can either pay the state to fix the problem, or you can pay it in these other ways, as, as I've mentioned. And I would think most people would say, let's fix the problem. How likely is this to get Governor Corbett's signature because he campaigned on a no-tax promise? Uh, I think he, he's willing to do it. Uh, you know, he's trying to put a proposal together. I think he's very concerned right now, and rightfully so, the economy that... Uh, you know, people who are struggling now, do we really want to ask them to pay more to, to drive our highways? Uh, and so that's a tough thing to, to ask. But, uh, you know, infrastructure is one of the best places that government can invest dollars into. And I think the return for the constituents, for the people of Pennsylvania, you know, just look, are, are we better off? People drive from the valleys, uh, particularly Belfont and that area, to State College to work every day. Are they better because they can go up I-99 than having to plod through the Benner Pike and up through uh, 26? Uh, I, I think they are much better off. And I think they would say, yeah, I'd pay a dollar extra. The beauty of the transportation money is this doesn't go to a general fund where it could go anywhere. If you're, if you're driving more, you're paying more, but it goes in directly to fix uh, the, the roads and bridges in, in Pennsylvania. If you're not driving a lot, you don't pay a lot more. And so I think it's a, it's a user fee setup, uh, and it's very fair. And I think most people, when they look at it, would understand that we have to maintain the system. Uh, the Marcellus Shale impact fee, mm -hmm. of course, is, a, is another tenacious uh, yeah. issue, really. And, and what's at issue is uh, who's going to collect that money and how it will be divided. Right. Where do you stand on that? Well, this, this is another one of those issues that's, that's been elusive. And, and I have spoke on the Senate floor. It sort of goes back to what I said earlier about compromise. Uh, you know, you have on, on one side, my colleagues in the Senate were screaming that, you know, the fees should be a lot, lot higher uh, and there should be, you know, more local control uh, to the to zoning. And the bill that we were, uh, and then you have, I'm sorry, the governor and some and leaders in the House of Representatives that want hardly any new fee and, and they want preemption from local control. Uh, the bill that we tried to run in the Senate was, was a compromise of both of that. It, it had, a, had a fee that was higher than what the House wanted, but lower than what the Senate Democrats wanted. And it also had a, just a model uh, zoning ordinance, not a preemption. Uh, we can't seem to get people to compromise on this issue for whatever reason. And, and, and we're wasting money, right. really, in time. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I said to my colleagues on the floor, I said, you know, we can scream about this all you want, but uh, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. And something's, you know, you can't let perfection be you know, the, the obstacle to getting something done. And so hopefully it's going to a conference committee now. We sent it over to the House. Uh, they're going to non-concur, and, and hopefully we'll get a, uh, in the beginning of the year, uh, get a compromise that, that puts something in place. I think it's important that we do get uh, an impact fee for the local communities. Um, you know, I, 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 we structure it in a way in the Senate that uh, the, the communities that are closest, like if you take Center County, for instance, you know, a lot of drilling going on in Snowshoe Township and Rush Township. Uh, there's a lot of impact on Phillipsburg Borough and Snowshoe Borough, and I, I think we structured in a way that they will benefit mostly from this as opposed to other municipalities in the county. Uh, which I think is only fair. So it's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's been elusive because people, for whatever reason, have sort of gone to their corners, and you can't do that in government. You have to compromise somewhere along the way, and uh, hopefully we'll get there. Speaking of, of compromise, uh, a lot of angry Democrats over redistricting. Yeah. Of course, after the last uh, census, Pennsylvania lost one congressional seat. We went from 19 to 18, yeah. and, and the Republicans have redrawn congressional districts. Uh, there's particular concern about what happened in the 7th district. Some yeah. say it looks like we, we poured a bucket of paint and said, <laughs> you know, this is, this is your district. How do you respond to that? There are some who say sure. that the public didn't have enough time, not more than 12 hours, to respond to how that came down. Well, the... The, the problem with, now, to understand, there's the legislative redistricting, which, which involves state legislative seats, is done by a commission, and, and that, that has been done. Uh, the legislative, the congressional redistricting is done like any other bill. It just goes through a process, committees, House, Senate, Governor, and, and done like a bill. Uh, the, the major problem you have with congressional redistricting is the absurdity that the federal government insists that there's a one, one person different, differential between congressional districts. I mean, you have to get it down to the exact amount of people in each district within one person. Now, that's one person of a census two years ago, which, of course, people have moved, people have passed away, people have been born during those two years, and so it's not, it's not even accurate anyway. Uh, but when you're not allowed to have any deviation, like I believe in a state legislative, the commission has about a two, two and a half percent deviation of population. You have your ideal district, and then you can go up or down by two or two and a half percent. By having the absurdity of having by one person, which isn't factual anyway, because of what I stated earlier, is you have to draw some crazy lines through the process to, to get that. You have to break up municipalities. You have to break up. Some precincts have to be broken up just to be able to get that perfect 
population. And so, you know, when, when we go through this... But, but critics say what's perfect oh, is, is that you ensure... Absolutely. That, Absolutely. That I, Republicans keep seats, and uh, if uh, Democrats were in power, that they'd keep yeah. seats. I, I understand the criticism, and some of it's probably fair. I think if you look at most of the map, um, it, it's pretty fair and, and pretty reasonably drawn. And when we when you get into these, I try to stay out of other parts of the state and, and worry about my part of the state. And I thought how the the fifth congressional district, which includes Center County, was drawn was fair. Uh, and so I didn't offer criticism of, of, of other the parts of the it. state. Uh, you know, if, if they can't get the support of, of those those senators, uh, they won't be able to pass the map because we have to pass it at some point. So if you look at, I mean, the, the, the perfect example is the Senate Democrats proposed a, a map uh, as well. And uh, it was just a sort of messy lines uh, uh, drawn all over the place. You had a seat from Greene County and, and the West Virginia border all the way up to Toga County, almost in New York. So, uh, you know, it's, there's no easy way to do this. Um, I thought the part of the state that I reside, that I represent, uh, was done fairly, and so I supported the map. Okay. Uh, lots of people are wondering about your own political ambitions, and I ask that knowing that you were encouraged along the way to mm -hmm. run for uh, Congressman John Peterson's seat when he decided not to seek re-election. Mm -hmm. And here in 2012, a number of your colleagues uh, encouraged you to run against uh, Robert Casey. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that's flattering. Um, you know, one, one of the best advice I ever got from, from Rick Santorum one time uh, when I was working for him is he said to me, you know, Jake, anyone can be a U.S. senator, but I'm the only one that can be my kid's father and my wife's husband. And as flattering as, as, as exciting as it is to maybe run for Congress or run for the U.S. Senate, although earlier criticism aside, I'm not so sure I want to be in Washington, D.C., but uh, I have three young children. I have a nine, seven, and five-year-old. I, I, selfishly, I love going to Lily Games. I love going to uh, my daughter. had a singing on stage. She's a local theater group here, and I love going to her performances. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't want to miss that. Uh, that's just me being selfish. I don't want to miss that. Uh, the opportunities are great, but I, I think I'm having a, a positive impact on my community and the job that I'm, I have now. Uh, I mean, that, that's why you go into public service, is to hopefully make your community a better place to live. And so... I, I try to create opportunities here in, in central Pennsylvania for people to live, and, and so I'm hoping my kids will want to do that as well. But uh, I'm, I guess I didn't run because I'm selfish. I, I enjoy uh, doing those uh, events with them and, and being close to home. All right. Senator Jake Corman, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you. Great being with you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with State Senator Jake Corman. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find information about legislation currently before the State Senate. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.